and again answering are the Eagles. Cato now for three. That's two in a row for the freshman. The steal, the spin, behind the back, behind the back, splitting the double team. Coming on! What's going on, guys? Thanks for tuning in to Screech Report. This is Elliot, joined here by Russell, as always. Um, you know, it's been a while again. Yeah, every time it's been a while, man. Well, life's getting weird. 2020 yeah. is probably one of the weirdest years of my life that I can remember. No, um, you were one. It was a really weird year. <laughs> you just can't remember it. Right. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, last time we were on, we were kind of playing around, joking around about this. Yeah, a little tongue-in-cheek action. This uh, uh, virus going around, then next right. thing you know, it's a pandemic. Then, and yeah, all of a sudden, it's serious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot to digest, and I don't know what to think. But it, either way, stay safe and, and keep practicing social distancing until this thing can uh, go away. But enough about that, because everyone's already hearing enough about that. Um, what's up, man? How's life? Well, life's good. I believe in the last pod we uh, told everyone because they all care about. Uh, I got a new place. Um, we're still like part time roommates because I come over here all the time getting my mail um, <laughs> and making my new puppy pee all over. Yeah, I uh, I excite his dog and she <laughs> pees. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's not her fault. Um, but uh, so don't worry, everyone. We're still social distancing. We just you know sort of live together. So. But um, yeah, things are going well. New house, uh, a lot of money spending on on things to get the new place looking good. But what quarantine about you? snacks. Uh, actually, I've been eating pretty well. Um, just because you know you do a big life transition, like a new place, it's like an opportunity. Fresh to, start. Yeah, it's an opportunity to say I don't live like I used to live, like a fat slob. I I, <laughs> I live this way, but at the same time, I'm home all day with the food. So it's it's sort of a civil war going on. I hear you there. I'm I'm trying to start a, a new workout plan and diet plan myself, but you can't call it the D word otherwise it never works. No, it's, it's a lifestyle it lifestyle change. change. Yes, not not. I'm not even gonna say it. But basically, just eat less pizza than you were before. Right. You can still eat pizza. Oh yeah, just pizza less. is essentially a salad. It's the most versatile food. Because mm-hmm. you got your dairy, you got your protein, you got your your grains. I don't know if you said this before, but that's the one food you could eat. The rest of your life. Yes. As long as you can spice it up different ways. Yeah, as long as I can have different toppings. I, that's the food I would never get sick of. I hear you there. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, this I, is an FGCU basketball podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you got to sprinkle a little bit of life. Right. Otherwise, uh, the off season is just... The off season. You know. So yeah, the last pod we did was a you know final season recap back in early March. Talking and about our awards. The awards. Yeah. That's that was a big hit. It was yeah. a good article. Yeah. Props so props to you on that. It's yeah. okay. Got a lot of former players. Uh, no, I guess not current. Former players. Um, thoughts on their time at FGCU and the yeah, impact. Yeah, we it. did the uh, the all-decade team that we put together. That was fun. Um, that, that was very fun to do. Very fun to talk to the guys about their their time with the university and sort of some of them who haven't been here for, you know, five years plus. So it's it's not like it's I just graduated a year or two ago. It's it's they've had time to, to yeah, and they they still value the time here. You know, when I was in college and just graduating high school, I thought high school my years there were like so important. And now, like almost ten years after graduating high right. school, I'm like that wasn't a big deal. College was my formative time. You know, so maybe you know it, it's just nice to know that some of those former players still really value their time with the university and especially that sweet 16 squad i mean that's gonna yeah. that's life changing that's yep. gonna be there forever mm-hmm. so there's been a lot of news in this off season this short off season so far i guess because the you know it, everything's been so different and nobody's doing anything there's no tv there's no recruiting is different i'm sure things things like that um you know, a lot of news at the end of the season. We talked a little bit, I think, maybe on the pod, about some some transfers and available scholarships and things like that. So, 
you know, uh, losing four guys, now five. Um, recently, Jalen Harper transferred. We saw that come across the verbal commits. Um, and addition of Eli Abeyev from Austin P. And now I think there's one extra scholarship. Who knows how that gets used, whether it's another, you know, transfer coming in or, you know, I imagine at least what I think is it's probably going to kind of be a next year look for a, you know, 2021 freshman. Um, but who knows? Yeah, it'll be interesting for sure. I know we've kind of talked about the 70% scoring returning this year, which is a far cry from the last two seasons. So it'll be interesting to see how that all gets pieced together. And, uh, you know, still a young team, but a lot more gel this year than, yeah. than, uh, last year. And guys, we're excited to announce our first guest on the podcast. Uh, this will be kind of our first, hopefully more to come on the off season for interviews, but we want to thank head coach Michael Fly for joining us tonight for a um, interview, talking about what's been going on in the off season and kind of what to expect for next season. So, uh, yeah, thanks and uh, enjoy. All right, coach, uh, how you doing in these uh, strange times we're living in? They are very strange. I'm spending a lot of time on my back patio uh heather and i take turns <laughs> holding jack and try to keep him from screaming while the other one tries to do some work so i do a lot of recruiting calls with one uh piece of my airpods in my right ear and him on my left shoulder trying to get him to go to sleep outside while she tries to get case work done as an attorney so it's interesting <laughs> times uh work working from home is not quite as fun as it might sound at first glance not even for you <laughs> Definitely not for us. A 10-month-old and a puppy makes it quite the challenge. Is that affecting uh, recruiting at all, or is it um, is it just as easy? I mean, I know you can't travel to go see anyone in person or, or any of that, but how is that from a remote standpoint? You know, it's different than anything I've ever dealt with, obviously. Um, you know, I think a great example is Eli Abayev that committed to us in a normal situation you know, Eli would have taken multiple uh, official visits and weighed his options by taking those visits and then, you know, trying to decide what was the best fit for him. And we started recruiting Eli when he left Austin T. And to be transparent with you guys, I was surprised when he committed because, you know, he basically was ahead of the curve and said, Coach, you know, I know that this is going to be a long-term situation. I'm probably not ever going to be able to take a visit. Uh, I know I want to come back to Florida. I've played with Jalen Warren. You know, I want to commit to you guys. And that's the first time I've ever taken a commitment from a guy that I've never met in person that <laughs> has never been on campus. <laughs> you know, so it's it's definitely a challenge. And then even right now as I start working on really zeroing in on the 2021 class, normally, you know, we would use April to evaluate and make decisions on guys who we're going to try to, put towards the front of the list, who do we think is good enough, who's not good enough, who's an offer guy versus an evaluation guy. And right now I'm really just having to trust my my sources. And, and as Coach Hamilton used to always say, your soldiers out in the field, you know, I've got to trust the guys that I know and, and have produced players over the years on who's good enough and who's not because all I really have to watch right now on 2021 kids is film. Well, I'll tell you the one basketball film that I'm watching right now is the last dance are you all caught up on that uh yeah i've been watching them you know like a kid in the candy store to be honest with you i think like everybody you know not having the nba playoffs and obviously i would much rather participate in the ncaa tournament than watch it but you know having a chance to watch my friends and the profession be able to coach in the ncaa tournament and was hoping that coach hamilton would have a chance to make a run and coach infield uh, you know, it's really been, I think, all of our sports fix. But for me, you know, I was, I missed Jordan a little bit in the 80s. I remember towards the end of the 80s, you know, him being a good player and he was on, you know, I, I told my wife, we, I had Valentine's with Michael Jordan on him. I remember that being a kid, but he won his first championship when I was in first grade and his last championship when I was in eighth grade. So, he was really during my formative years, you know, I got to watch that whole Bulls run unfold. And 
it's so funny in texting with our players and talking to recruits about that time, you know, they're learning a lot of this for the first time. And some of them, I talked to a kid last night who's one of our big priorities in an upcoming class. And, you know, for me, I don't want to miss a minute. And, and if I had the time, I'd probably rewind them and, and watch them again. He said, well, coach, man, you know, those come on late. I've been falling asleep. And I'm thinking, falling asleep? How can you fall asleep on Michael Jordan? But, you know, to the <laughs> to the younger generation, you know, they knew Kobe and they know LeBron. And, you know, Jordan is just a a emblem on a shoe that they buy. So it's it's so interesting because I think, you know, that team and him as a player meant so much to so many people at different points in their lives, you know, whether you were an adult and following him and just really enjoying the the viewing experience or like me as a child and thinking that, you know, he could do things on the basketball court that, you know, you didn't think were possible. So it's it's been really fun for me to kind of relive almost my childhood um, and also, you know, to – see if there's anything that I can take, you know, even from a coaching standpoint. And I'll give you an example. You know, I had forgotten that Phil Jackson used to give those guys books that he wanted them to read as a team. And they would have almost like a book club. And that's one thing I've discussed with the assistant is, you know, it's not like our guys got anything going on right now outside of classes. So <laughs> that may be something that we look into, you know, making sure that everybody in the program has the same book. You know, they're reading it after the two a week, they're discussing it as a team. Uh, so I think a lot of the, the lessons, you know, from that documentary and those films can be applicable to teams and players today as well. So what I'm hearing is that you're going to start running the triangle offense? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, I think the triangle is a very good offense, but I think a lot of people would tell you Jordan, Pippen, Horace, you know, uh, Shaq, Kobe, those guys, run what you want to when you got those guys, and he offense looks really, really good. So about about Eli, is was he a guy that was kind of on your radar for a while or, or just kind of when that extra scholarship became available? Did you know you wanted it to be, um, you know, another, add another big to the equation um, or what? Well, we we started talking, you know, as soon as the season was over about what we wanted in the front court. And obviously, you know, Justice, we thought, played an important role and really, to be honest with you guys, probably performed um, better and different than we expected. I mean, he was a guy we expected to block shots and catch lobs, and we really recruited him with the expectation that he would back up Brian Thomas all year. And he was thrown into a starting role and developed a jump hook, which I never thought, you know, we recruited him and I joked with him and said, Hey, Justice, just so we're on the same page, I'm never going to run a play for you. We're going <laughs> to tell you to run to the rim, rebound, block shots. And he was totally confident and comfortable in that role. But with Brian's uh, struggles from an injury standpoint, obviously he was forced to play a lot more minutes than any of us thought. And, to his credit, he did a great job with that. But him and Dakota are really rim run, lob catchers, you know, kind of in the Eric McKnight mold. And they're not throw it on the block and score guys. And that's one thing that we felt like we missed this year a little bit. We thought Brian was going to be able to score on the block with his development. And unfortunately, you know, it was out of Brian's control, but he wasn't able to go through the development and the, the personal improvement that he normally would based on what he was dealing with from an injury standpoint. So we felt like Eli gave us a guy that's produced at the Division One level. You know, he averaged eight points and eight rebounds in a 21-win program in a very good league in the OVC. Uh, we had some familiarity with him, obviously, with Jalen Moore, and those guys played together and had an unbelievable year in junior college. So he wasn't a guy that was on our radar until he hit the transfer list. And then based on the relationships with Jalen, his junior college coach, uh, we've got a close relationship with one of the guys at Austin P. It was really just a good fit all around. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it all it all kind of worked out as, you know, it's, it's you know, nice to see some kind of um, that sort of awareness, too, of the situation being what it is that he might not take an actual, you know, physical visit to the campus and quick to agree and have those connections. So, it, you know, looks like it's important. Hey, coach, jumping back. We're, we're excited about him. 
Sorry, I was I was gonna jump back to the whole uh, the the whole COVID nineteen situation. Did you guys have any heads up as to what was coming, or was this all kind of spurred on by the NBA shutting down first, and then from there it was kind of just a trickle effect? Or did you guys have some sort of uh, advanced notice uh, yeah, that was coming? It, it was interesting. You know, obviously our season ended earlier than we wanted it to. When the season ended in early March, our plan was to give our guys about two weeks to let their bodies rest, recover, and then get back in the gym and start working out until, you know, the NCAA uh, has a shutdown when finals uh, begin. So that was our plan. And then, unfortunately, in that two-week span, the COVID-19 stuff hit. And, you know, we just kind of followed at SGCU, obviously, the advice and direction of President Martin first and foremost, and then Ken Kavanaugh. Um, and, you know, there was a point where we still thought that the women were going to have a chance to play in the title game and maybe that game was going to happen and we were going to have fans. And then in the in the span of a few days, the NBA shut down, you know, and then the NCAA was quick to follow. So it all happened, you know, really quickly. And it was it was a challenge because we really weren't sure originally if it was best to have guys leave campus or stay on campus because originally we thought we were going to, you know, close down for a couple of weeks. And then I believe we were going to start classes back on uh, March 29th, if I remember correctly. So, you know, then all of a sudden it became, Hey, this is going to be a, a semester long shutdown. So we went from feeling like it was probably smartest to have guys here with us, you know, in a, in a campus community with young, healthy people and then in a quick turnaround, it became, hey, we need to get these guys out of here, get them to their families, and, you know, make sure that we're not putting anybody in a in a dangerous situation, including us. How are your guys doing? Been in contact with uh, with them a lot? Or um, is it – I know this – you're not allowed to really uh, do any kind of practices or, or get-togethers in the off season right now, but are they working out on their own or getting feedback? Yeah, feedback? as much as they – as much as they can. I mean, I, I kind of, what I do as a head coach from a communication standpoint with our guys, not every day, uh, especially during the season, but I would say three to four times a week when I wake up, you know, I get on Twitter, if I'm reading a certain book, if I've listened to a podcast that I think that there's something applicable that will help them, you know, whether it's on the floor or off the floor, I try to send them some type of inspirational text message with something I think might help them several times a week. So I'm still doing that. We did a team Zoom call the other day with all of our returners just checking in on everybody. And, and Coach Ken Tim's kind of led the call and, and said, you know, hey, guys, let's, let's do this. I want everybody, starting with Coach Fly, to talk about what is something you've learned about your family that you didn't know, you know, because now you're spending so much time with them and what is a hobby that you guys have picked up? So we just went, you know, around the group, you know, Hey, what, what's going on with your life? Tell me about it. And it was really interesting to hear some of the things that guys are doing, but you know, I've, I've had some guys send me uh, pictures of themselves lifting weights with gasoline cans in their garages, you know, other guys are, shooting on hoops outside, you know, some guys are doing P90X. I mean, it's it's really an interesting time because we're limited with certain things we can do with the NCAA as far as what we can communicate with those guys and what we can send videos of. Uh, but, you know, each guy understands that this is really a valuable time. And what I've explained to them is when we get back in August and when we tip in November, it's going to be obvious what teams around the country have self-starters and guys that are self-motivated versus teams that have really wasted this time and gotten out of shape and, and not really thought about the season. So, you know, we're confident with the group that we have that, you know, these guys are doing everything they can to be ready to go in August, hopefully. Sure. We hope so. <laughs> um, so kind of transitioning to another new guy, an incoming freshman, um, Zach Anderson, uh, recently, uh, what is it? Uh, Class 7A, All-State second teamer. Um, what kind of – what does he project to be from the team? Obviously, he hasn't been there yet. But um, as far as skill set, uh, position, you kind of foresee for him. And what does he just bring to the table for the team? Yeah, you know, I want to be careful with setting any expectations for young guys just because, you know, obviously 
they're coming into a new environment. Um, it's a new situation for them. So, you know, I don't want to put pressure on Zach or any of our newcomers as far as setting a, a expectation for fans or, or anybody that follows our program on what to expect from him. But, you know, as far as what we know about him as a player and a person, uh, Zach comes from one of the, the more respected high school programs in the state of Florida and Apopka. Coach Scott Williams has won multiple Coach of the Year awards and runs really a college-level program at the high school level. Uh, those guys, Zach was a, a group leader of players there at Apopka that he would text me sometimes before I was up at 530 and he was in the gym by himself. Well, I shouldn't say by himself, but with his teammates. And that was not coach-led. That was player-led, uh, making sure that those guys were getting extra shooting, playing one-on-one, -on -one, working on footwork, working on finishing moves. Um, Zach is a guy that we identified very early on in the recruiting process. He's a 6'8", uh, skilled four-man that can maybe play the three down the road in a very big lineup. I think his best position right now is as a mismatch four. Uh, he can put the ball on the on the floor pretty well for his size. Good athlete, good shooter. Uh, does some of the things that I think Quanji Samuels will be able to do as he continues to grow and develop. Uh, but you know, he he's kind of that long, rangy, skilled four with athleticism that you know we've really been trying to replace really since Chase Beeler graduated. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know what type of career Zach will have, but th that's one of the guys that. In recruiting him, we compared him to Chase and showed him videos on Chase. And, hey, these are the type of plays we think that, you know, with your body type and your skill level, as you continue to develop, hopefully you're able to make some of these same plays down the road. Sure. Um, so another, I mean, another uh, All-State second teamer was, uh, we just found out, is uh, Luis Rolone, um, who, you know, same high school as uh, Victor Rosa, what was it like recruiting both of those guys? Uh, did you know kind of going in and doing your visits that you were recruiting two guys in the same team? Or was it kind of, a, oh, look at this guy too. He's He looks like we need him on the team too. Um, <laughs> um, what was that process like? And, you know, what are, what do those guys kind of bring to the table from what you've seen? Yeah, it was, it was really interesting the way Luis and Victor's uh, recruitment went. Victor was a guy that, when I saw him as a junior, we offered him a scholarship on the spot the very first time I saw him play. Uh, once we watched him and evaluated him in the gym, uh, there were a multitude, of pro a multitude of programs that came in and also offered him. And we kind of got the feeling that, you know, Victor and, and the people surrounding him were really looking at the highest level for him to play at. So, you know, we kept a relationship but really didn't think going into this time a year ago that Victor was a guy that was realistically on our board. Uh, when he got through the summer, he played part of the summer with the Puerto Rican national team, so it was a little bit out of the spotlight here in the U.S., um, came into the fall. And Luis, ironically, when we first went in to kind of check on Victor and just see who else those guys had, Luis actually had no Division One offers. And, you know, I thought when I first saw him, man, he's a really good passer. He's really, really competitive. Uh, but he doesn't fit a prototypical body type of the point guards that we've had here in the past. He's not an elite athlete. He's not a fast switch guy. He's a big, strong, you know, kind of built similar to Brett Comer almost in his build, um, who can really pass the ball. So, the way the recruitment kind of worked out was, you know, we originally said, man, it'd be great to be able to get Victor because he can really shoot the ball at a high level at 6'5 and has been a high-level shot maker throughout his career. The more we evaluated Luis, you know, you kind of have to trust your eyes and not worry too much about who else is recruiting a guy, but, you know, trust that if there's a guy that's, that's helping, uh, one, Victor get wide open looks, but also – leading a really competitive post-grad program on a national level, you know, really with his passing ability and toughness more so than anything, you know, there's got to be something to that. So we watched Luis multiple times, and, and he, he did not have a Division One offer when we offered him. I joked with his, his high school coach, you know, just so, you know, you're in the loop. When we offer kids, a lot of times a lot of schools will follow us. So 
we might be his first offer, but we probably won't be his last. And true to form, once we offered, here came four to five to six more within the week. So we uh, we kind of explained to Victor and Luis both, hey, we don't want one of you. We want both of you. You know, they're really guys that, you know, uh, Central Point almost beat uh, Prolific Prep and Jalen Green, who just committed to the G League in a, I believe it was double or triple overtime game with the grind session, and, and Victor and Luis were at the forefront of that charge. So we were very clear. We didn't just want Victor or just want Luis. We wanted both of them. And so that was kind of the way we recruited them as a a tandem. You know, obviously Victor is a guy that benefits from Luis's passing and vision, and Luis really benefits from Victor's shot-making, shot-making ability. But I think you're talking about two guys that are uh, extremely hungry, Obviously, they came over not long ago from Puerto Rico. Um, they're excited to have a, a college scholarship opportunity and have the chance to continue to play at a high level like they did at Central Point and also with the Puerto Rican national team. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's nice to have that, you know, sort of built-in chemistry coming in. Um, that definitely helps a freshman, I'd imagine, as well. Um, so, and, and also the, the narrative of, of what, you know, you can see on social media and articles and whatnot matches a lot of, of what you've said with, you know, it's, you look at whatever website, you know, max preps or, or verbal commits or whatever it is. And that, you know, you see Victor Rosa's, you know, three star most places and a four maybe somewhere. Um, and, you know, you see two and three for, for uh, Luis. And, um, but then, you know, lately it's been – you can't go a day without seeing another tweet from a coach or, or a, a news outlet talking about how, you know, Luis is the, one of the best passers in the country um, entering the college program. So it's definitely something that's going to be fun to, you know, to experience next year and see see what happens. Yeah, we – and like I said, I, I want to try to keep – expectations in general, you know, as realistic as possible, especially for freshmen. But, you know, I do think both of those guys, you know, they've played against um, high-level competition on the international uh, circuit, you know, with the national team. And, and both of them were playing, you know, in a, in, a, in a situation at Central Point where playing on the grind session and playing against those national teams, you know, you're not playing normal high school programs. So, you know, we feel like those guys have competed at a high level and, and we're excited to see, you know, what their development is like as they come into college. And then uh, finally, one of the, the last newcomers, and again, I don't want to harp on expectations, but Dom London from Harkham College had a huge year as a JUCO player. He was named Male Athlete of the Year. Uh, how long was he on uh, your radar? Really interesting story with him, and that's what I really like about this class. You've got guys that come from very different backgrounds, some of them very humble beginnings that have really worked themselves into being, you know, what we hope to be very good college basketball players. But Dom played at a very small high school program. He rarely competed against Division One caliber players in high school. Uh, he was the only recruitment he had coming out of high school was Division Three offers. And Harkham Junior College, which is a, a top 25 uh, nationally relevant program out of Philadelphia, basically said to Dom, you know, we think you're better than a Division three level guy. Why don't you come to Harkham and see if you can improve your recruitment? And, you know, Dom agreed to go to junior college. He did not need to. He was a good student. Uh, but he decided that was the best route for him as far as making sure that his recruitment got to the level that he wanted it to. So, he had a really good freshman year, very productive, uh, shot the ball at a really high level, averaged double figures, became a starter, and myself and Coach Marsh saw him at a junior college event in the summer. And Coach Marsh had him listed as a guy that we needed to evaluate because he had a relationship with the head coach at Harkham. So so we, we have Coach Marsh and I specifically evaluated Don during the summer junior college events. You know, again, his recruitment went from basically, you know, very little Division One recruitment to over 20 offers in the span of about two weeks. Uh, so we, we made him a priority, you know, from a standpoint of myself or Donnie basically were in Philadelphia once a week until he told us yes or he told us no. Uh, we were fortunate to get, you know, I think he visited four different programs. We were fortunate to get an early visit from him and uh and he made a decision to commit to us and 
and went on to have a really good season. I think Harkin probably would have finished in the top 25 and been invited to Hutch, which is the National Junior College Tournament. But unfortunately, the other guy on Dom's team, Dom ended up being named a third-team All-American nationally. Uh, they had a big kid that was signed with Penn State that got hurt, and it really hurt their team because if you watch the films on Dom, he was basically face guarded and, and boxing one once the, the big kid got hurt. They ended up not getting an invite to Hutch. So uh, we're excited not just about what he can do on the court, but he's a 3.7 student. Uh, he's a leader of their program at Harkham. Uh, I actually spent some time with their athletic director when I went up to recruit him, and they can't say enough good things about him off the court as well as on the court. So, you know, we think he can step in and fill a role as a shooter and playmaker basketball-wise. But I'm also excited about the intangibles and the leadership that he brings off the court. Very cool. Excited to see all these new pieces coming together. But let's talk about some of the returning scoring. Um, only one JUCO transfer this uh, upcoming year rather than three. Um, but we're returning 70% of the scoring. What are your expectations entering year three? <laughs> After some of the things we've experienced in the first few years, uh, like I said, <laughs> my expectations are going to be to try to remind people as hard as it is, I think, in this program that, you know, we, we took over a program in transition. Um, you know, Coach Dooley obviously did a tremendous job when he was here as a head coach. Uh, but, you know, our first season taking over a roster that lost all five starters, including an NBA player and a guy that, you know, I think, potentially with a different decision may have ended up at that level and Zach Johnson, you know, this has been a, a situation that we have had to hit reset and, and rebuild from day one. So I want to try to keep expectations um, realistic, which is, you know, this is year three of a rebuilding situation and really year two of our, of our full recruiting class as a staff. You know, when we were, when I first got the job, we were able to sign Cedric Cashmere, and we're very fortunate to get him late, uh, and we're was also fortunate to get Ricardo Day late. But these are the first two full recruiting classes that this staff has had to be able to go out and evaluate, decide what we needed to uh, fill as far as basketball needs, leadership needs. So our expectations are that obviously we improve on what was a really challenging season across the board, both from a scheduling standpoint, but also from an injury and expecting guys to perform in roles that they probably were not ready for or did we expect them to have to be ready for before we dealt with, you know, a lot of the challenges that we dealt with. So, you know, I think this is much different than our first two years because last year you're returning Zach Scott, Brian Thomas, and Caleb Caddo who I think combined to average maybe 12 points or 13 total. And obviously Brian was very limited by injuries, and Zach was thrust into a role that I think was a major challenge for him. Uh, so it's a lot different situation because we're going to return. Obviously, Jalen's a double-figure scorer at the point. Caleb's a double-figure scorer on the wing. Uh, Cyrus, as, as we all saw, made a major, major, maybe the biggest jump I've seen from – the time the kid got here to the end of the season. Uh, Sam and Justice were both starters at different points here in the season. So this is a much different situation than it was. So my hope is that we had so many toss-up games that if a few shots go in here or there, there's a different decision made, you know, in a certain situation, you know, both for me or a player, you know, I think our record and our season looks a lot different. You know, but unfortunately, you know, with some of the challenges that we dealt with, you know, it ended up being a season that when I look back, you say, man, you know, how did how did that go that way? And, and how did we end up in a certain situation, you know, after a game? But I think there's a lot of things that, that led to the year that we had. So my hope is obviously we improve on this season. Uh, but more than anything, we continue to push the program forward and make sure that in the future, we're never in a rebuild situation, that we're in a let's continue to add, let's continue to grow, and hopefully the program is extremely healthy going forward across the board. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, as we said, 70% returning, and that, you know, bodes well. And, you know, with that 70%, there's 30% loss, obviously senior and 
Tracy Hector, and then you know a slew of transfers early, um, and then and then filling those you know spaces with incoming freshmen as well as a transfer. But um, recently, uh, Jalen Harper entered the transfer portal um, according to verbal commits. Uh, I don't know if you're able to speak on that at all, um, and whether that kind of whether the backcourt was simply just kind of crowded with all the you know guys staying as well as you know Luis and and uh, Dom London coming in um are you able to speak on any of that yeah for sure and, and I always say this you know transfers are a part of college basketball especially you know now I think the national average is about two per year um what we try to do is every season at the end of the year we did this after my first year we did this when coach Julie was here when Coach Enfield was here, you know, you try to sit down with each one of your players and kind of take a a look at the season and say, you know, what went right, what went wrong, and what do we see going forward. And I think with each each uh, player that decided to transfer uh, this year and, and also in my first year, you know, we had an honest conversation about, you know, roles coming back next year, what those roles might look like, especially with incoming players. And I think guys made decisions that were best for them and also best for our program. So Jalen, just like, you know, Zach, just like Malik, just like Brian, great kid, great family. Uh, he's got my full support. I think the world of his talent, you know, I think he just made a decision like those guys that maybe the role I saw for him and the role he saw for himself we're a little bit different. And I think that's just the reality of college basketball. And you have to continue to recruit and try to get uh, the players that best fit your system, best fit your culture, best fit your needs. And sometimes, unfortunately, that means that that might impact other players, you know, that are on the way out. So Jalen, like the other guys, again, fully support them. Um, but I, I felt like we made some mutual decisions with those players and myself and the staff that were beneficial for everybody. Well, coach, that's about all the questions we got. I thank you for the time and uh, we can't wait for next November pending all this COVID stuff uh, goes away and we can get back to normal lives. But I know there's no such thing as a regular starting five, but can you give us a way too early starting five lineup for next season? <laughs> you guys are trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's definitely way too early. Uh, you know, I don't think we'll know any of that until we get into practice and roles start, start to be defined. Uh, obviously, again, we've got – this is different than last year where, you know, last year we had Zach and Brian that had been part-time starters and Caleb had never started a game. So I think there's – it's a different situation in that Eli started every game at Austin P last year and was a very productive player. He got stronger as the year went on and, and had double doubles against Murray State, against Belmont, against really good programs in that league. So obviously he's a guy that's produced as a starter at the Division One level. I think you, you can say the same thing for Jalen, for Caleb, uh, Cyrus, Sam, and Justice. Obviously prove that they can be effective. I mean, this is actually uh, John Sennett would have to quote me on this, but. I'm not sure that we've ever had a season where three different players were named newcomer of the week at a different time of the season, you know, and having Dakota, Sam, and Jalen all be recognized by the league that they were the best newcomer in the league that week, I think speaks volumes about where we can be if we can stay healthy and guys develop the way that, you know, we want them to develop. So that is, that's the major difference is, you know, we're returning enough guys that, you know, if you wanted to start all guys that have started in Division One, we've got five guys that we can say that have done that at this point. You know, and this time last year, we didn't have close to that. So I have no idea who will start, who won't start. You know, we'll, we'll throw the ball up and start in individuals in August. And I think in the best programs, that's what you have. And I thought that hurt us a little bit this year with injuries. There wasn't enough open competitions for, hey, if you don't play well in practice this week, you know, you may not start. And I think that that was a, a hard thing for our program. You know, when you have guys that aren't able to practice that, you know, or, or on some minutes restriction, you aren't able to hold guys as accountable as you want to be able to because they know realistically maybe the guy behind them isn't physically able to perform at the level they would be able to if they were fully healthy. So, 
that's what I'm excited about is an open competition at every spot. Uh, I'm excited about, you know, having some depth where, you know, if a guy decides that he's not going to put in extra work that week or he doesn't compete in practice, then, you know, you could lose a starting job just based on your performance even in practice. And that's not – that is something we did have in years past and I thought really kept guys on edge. That's not something we've had the luxury of uh, of in my first two years as a head coach. So I don't have an early starting five, but I do think we'll have a very competitive group as far as who is that starting five and are those guys able to maintain those spots throughout the season. Time will tell. Um, excited to see the team back on the court in November. Again, thanks for uh, your time tonight. We appreciate it, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. And uh, stay safe out there. We appreciate you guys supporting our program, covering our program. And anybody that's listening, we, we fully appreciate our fan support now more than ever during these trying times, but also through two seasons of transition that, you know, there are nights that I think we all say, okay, we see, you know, the, the vision of the program and man, this was a great night. And there's other nights where we all, you know, watch the game and we say, man, you know, we, we got to get where we feel like we all can get. So. We appreciate everybody's support throughout, you know, the thick and thin of, of trying time, sometimes during the transition, but we're all excited about year three, and, and we appreciate everything that you do for our program from a coverage standpoint. Thank you. Thank all right, you. guys, have a Thank great you. night. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. You too. Well, guys, that about wraps things up. Um, thanks again, Coach Fly, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we're looking forward to the next one and looking forward to see you guys back on the court in November. Uh, Until next time, thanks for tuning in.